Hi, my name is Mike Montaigne. I'm the communication coordinator here at the Rock Bible Church. And man, we just want to thank you so much for tuning into our page. If you haven't liked and subscribed to us yet, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down there and subscribe to our page. That way you can get notifications every time that we drop a video. Now, if you live around here in the area, we would love for you to come and check us out here in person. We want to get to know you. I hope this video has blessings upon your life and I hope you enjoy it. So go ahead, sit back, relax, and listen to the message. And you guys have an amazing day. Amen. I grew up in Ohio on a very large dairy farm. And I, I like money. Anybody in here like money? And I used to do things to make money. Not only did we have a large herd of cows, I also had 150 chickens. I had a couple of horses. And the other thing, I, I'm an outdoorsy kind of guy. I like to hunt fish. And I also trapped in Ohio. And on our farm, we had a creek that ran through the center of our farm. And I used to trap muskrat. Now, muskrats, you know, not the smartest critter on the face of the earth. Because they had these mudslides that they would make sliding down into the creek. <clears throat> and so they would slide down into the creek, and at the end of their slide, I would have a trap. And they would get caught in that trap. And they would drown. I know, ooh, that's morbid, Terry. No, well, you know. <clears throat> I wanted to make money, and I could get $45 a pelt. And back in the 70s, that was a lot of money. Okay. And if they weren't died, I had to go out early, early in the morning before milking. And milking was at 4.30 every day, seven days a week. I had this uh, club. It was a, called a tire buddy. And it was what semi-drivers used to uh, hit the tires to see if they were flat or not. And it had a piece of metal on the end of it. And if the muskrat wasn't dead, and I'd walk up to it and pop, like little bunny foo-foo. All right. So that was, that's what kind of a trap. Okay. Then on that farm, you can well imagine we had mice and rats. Even though we had about 100 cats running around on the farm, we still had mice. And so we had mice traps. Right? And they, you, you all know what they are. You bring them back and they, but you had to bait them. Okay? The same thing with the muskrats. I had to put some corn around the trap so they would go down the slide to try to get that corn. Okay, so that's a couple of traps. Then, living here in Florida, I've had to deal with armadillos. I hate armadillos. I work very hard on my yard. And they love to get in there and root and look for those grubs. Even though I treat for grubs all the time, they still get in my yard. And I have a bunch, I had a bunch of them this year. I even had families. You trap them with this. Life trap. Now, I know there's other ways now. What, what you do with this, you set the trap and you put it right in front of their hole. You put a couple of cinder blocks on the sides. And they walk right into it, not realizing what they're walking into. They walk right into the trap. The door shuts. You got an armadillo. Now the question is, what am I going to do with a live armadillo? Oh, um, sometimes, but, you know, I live in a neighborhood, and my neighbors come running out and if they hear a gunshot. So... I would take the critters, I would take them all the way to Jennings Forest to let them go. And so I would take them out there, they back, back there in the corner, all right, and I would hold this up, and then I would shake it and try to get them out of the trap. They wouldn't get out of the trap! <laughs> they'd take those uh, sharp claws and they would hang on the back of it, and I could even do it like that, and they'd just be hanging there. They wouldn't want to leave the trap. And finally had to kick it around a little bit and finally get, get them out of the trap. But you see, we fall in the traps all the time. Some traps are baited. Some traps are not, and we walk right into them. So I want to talk to you today about four traps 
that the enemy sets for us. And to get started on that, we've got to go back to Genesis. Genesis 1.31. We know that God created the world. We've heard that story, right? Six days he created the world, seventh day he took a rest. After each day he created the world, he says, it was good. Right? You all say it was good. It was good. But then, in verse 31 of chapter 1, it says, God saw all that he made, and it was very good. That includes everything. That includes you and me. And he says, it was very good. Right. Look to somebody on your side and say, say, you're very good. You're very good. You're very good. All right? Now, here, here is the thing. God had this beautiful garden, and in the middle of the garden, he had these two trees. The tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And God showed Adam all the trees, the whole garden. He showed it all to him, all right? And he showed it to Eve, and he said, all of these trees you can eat from, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat that tree from that tree. Why did they eat from that tree? If God told them not to eat from that one tree when they had all the other trees, why'd they do it? I don't understand. Well, if you Google, you know you find everything on Google, right? If you Google, why did Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit, you would get the answer that most people buy into, they believe, they ate the fruit because of pride. They wanted to be like God. That's what most people think. But in Genesis, we read that God created Adam and Eve in his own image, in his own likeness. What this means is that they were already like God. So they didn't eat the fruit to be like God because they already were like God. They were created in his image. Are you hearing me this morning? Uh, they ate the fruit because the serpent convinced them that they were not like God. And they believed his lie. Hmm. You see, the serpent got them to question their identity of who they truly were. Their identity. We deal with a lot of that today, don't we? Who we are. Our identity. John Gordon, in his book, The Garden, states, the serpent caused them to question and forget their identity of who they truly were. Here they were, children of God, made in his image, and were already like God. And the serpent attacked them at the very core of this truth, caused them to forget their identity. Now, we don't forget our identity, do we? They were attacked in their identity instead of trusting and obeying God not to eat the fruit and remembering who they were. They are now separated from God. So here's the question. Why did they forget who they were? We can ask ourselves that same question. The story of Adam and Eve in the garden is not just a story about them. It's also a story about us. We are created in the image of God. However, we believe Satan's lies that we are less than what God created us to be. We fall into one of four traps. Now, these traps were, aren't origin, original with me. They were, came up by a clinical psychologist who's a Christian whose name is Robert S. McGee. He wrote a book called The Search for Significance. I highly recommend that book. In fact, Billy Graham said that it was, it's the book that every Christian ought to read, The Search for Significance, Our Identity. So there's four traps. The first trap is called the performance trap. The performance trap. Hmm. Oh, do we ever have to try and perform? Most of us don't realize just how much Satan deceives us. He 
leads us down paths of destruction with a blindfold. Kind of like the armadillos. We just walk into a trap and not realize it. He has taken us captive of our inability to meet our standards and make slaves of our self-esteem. He has put us in chains that keep us from feeling love, knowing freedom, and Christ's purpose for our lives. Paul tells us in Colossians 2.8, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. My identity is in God because I'm created in His image. Are you hearing me this morning? It's a sign of maturity when we begin testing the deceitful thoughts of our minds against God's Word. His Word. God's Word. Again, Paul states in 1 Corinthians 2.16, we no longer have to live by our fleshly thoughts. We have the mind of Christ. Are you kidding me? We do. Because of what Christ did for us on that, the cross, we can have the mind of Christ. Now, you'll begin to see where I'm going with all of this. McGee states, through his Spirit, we can challenge the indoctrinations and traditions that have long held us in guilt and condemnation. We can then replace those deceptions with the powerful truths of Scripture. We have this belief that success will bring fulfillment and happiness. Time after time, we try to measure up, thinking that if we can meet these different standards, we would feel good about ourselves. Then when we don't meet those standards, we feel miserable. Now, when we do meet them on a regular basis, we feel good. But on occasion, failure may be devastating, and that dominates our perception of ourselves. If you and I consider our self-worth on our ability to meet certain standards, we will try to meet those certain standards. We will try to satisfy our needs by avoiding risk or trying to succeed no matter the cost, no matter what, failure is a constant enemy. But listen to me. Praise God. He has a cure. He has a way for us to get out of this trap. It's called justification. We have been justified, placed in the right standing before God through Christ's death on the cross where he paid for our sins. God didn't stop just with our forgiveness. He also granted us the righteousness of Christ. So, in Isaiah 55, it talks about Jesus. And he says about this. Let's say that my wallet, and there's nothing in it. I don't even know why I carry it. Except for it's got a seminal on it. <laughs> Let's say that my wallet, it should be much bigger than this, has all my sins in it. Every sin that I have committed in my 61 years of life. Let's say it's all in here. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want these sins shouted from the house, housetops. Amen? We have the righteousness of Christ. In Isaiah, it says that God has taken all of our sins all of our unrighteousness, and he laid them on Christ. Christ has taken away all of our sins. His righteousness. Not anything that we've done. It's Christ. Amen? So we're totally free. Look at somebody and say, I'm free. Woo, I'm free because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. I'm free. If you take those, those things and understand what he has done, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the bottom line is that justification means that God has not only forgiven our sins, but has also granted us the righteousness of Christ. Because of justification, we bear Christ's righteousness 
and are therefore fully pleasing to God. Ooh, I'm fully pleasing to God. I'm fully pleasing to God. Because of justification, no matter what I've done, Christ has forgiven me, and I'm pleasing to God because I am his. See where I'm going with this? Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace through God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only is there the performance trap, but there is also the approval trap. <laughs> The approval trap is where we base our self-worth on what we perceive others think about us. <gasps> now, I've gone to, <clears throat> from meddling to preaching now because every one of us have been in this trap. Am I right? See, the performance trap and the approval trap, they go together. See, that approval trap is like a vending machine. There is this invisible keypad and people come and punch in the right number, beep, 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 and then out comes the word yes. All right? Because people come to you and know that you won't say no because you want that approval. You want to be well-liked. You want to be popular. So whenever somebody comes and wants something done, they'll come to you and they push those right buttons and a yes will come out regardless of all of your plates that you got going. You ever see the uh, show where the guy is spinning the plates, trying to keep all the plates in the air and running from here, spinning this one? <gasps> oh, got to go over here and just got to spin this one. And pretty soon all those plates fall. And you see, when we keep saying yes, and all those people who keep coming to us and asking us to do things, and we say yes, we begin to resent them. Don't know what all I got going on and stuff. Well, it's your own fault because you keep saying yes instead of no. It's like that vending machine. You begin to say, man, I don't have time to finish what I already got going on. Now I got this to do. But you just can't say because you long for the approval of others. And by saying yes, you will get that approval you so desperately want. However, you spend all that time to build, trying to please and get respect. And after all your sincere effort, if there is one word of unappreciation, just one, then your whole life goes down the drain. Then you get into a pity party. And then you get discouraged. You think, I must be approved by certain others to feel good about myself. Listen, folks, I used to hunt for approval. I used to hunt for compliments. If I did something and I thought it was really good and nobody told me I did a good job, I would go and ask. You think I did a good job? I would go ask for approval because I needed those approval. Because that's how I felt good about myself. I never got any approval from my dad. Never. If I messed up or did something wrong, oh, I heard about that. So what is God's truth to get you out of this trap? It's called reconciliation. The approval, addiction, the answer is Christ's sacrificial death on the cross that pays for our sin. Here we find forgiveness, reconciliation, and acceptance in Christ. There is nothing we can do to make Christ love us any more than what he has already shown us. Are you hearing me this morning? There is nothing you can do any more to make him love you for what he's already did. I don't think if Christ was here today, and he, if he were to stand here, I don't think he would do a bunch of miracles or anything. I think he would just stretch his arms out and say, I love you. I love you. I totally accept you. There's nothing we can do to make him love us any more than what he has already shown. Woo, are you hearing me this morning? This should get you excited. Reconciliation means that those who were enemies have become friends. Paul tells us, Colossians 1, 21 and 22. 
And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Woo! The performance trap and the approval trap cause us to evaluate ourselves and others apart from God's truth. So if we think that a person's values and failures makes them acceptable or unacceptable of love, and we feel completely justified in condemning those who fall, fail, including ourselves, self-condemnation, would be calling ourselves, you're stupid. Terry, you're just stupid. Terry, you're dumb. Terry, you're an idiot. Don't answer that. I can't seem to do anything right. Anybody have ever said those words about yourself? Mm -hmm. Or oh, make jokes about ourselves? And not allowing any room for error with others? We can be harsh, sarcastic, ooh, sarcastic, or give the cold shoulder. Any form of condemnation communicates I'll get you for that, my pretty. If you don't know what movie that's from, come see me. You see, when failure happens, we either point a finger unconsciously or consciously. Somebody has to be blamed. We search for someone to blame. And that all comes back to Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. They heard the sound, they, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They probably made some designer fig leaves. Or something. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Idiot. Then the Lord God said to the woman, Woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, mm, The serpent, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. The blame game. We're masters at it, aren't we? We have a hard time owning up to our own mistakes. God's answer to the blame game is a big word. It's called propitiation. Everybody say propitiation. And what that simply means is that Christ's death on the cross satisfies the wrath of God. Are you see where I'm going with this? It is the act of soothing the hostility and the need for vengeance. God's propitiation of providing Jesus for our sin is the greatest demonstration of God's love for you and me. <laughs> Somebody in the first service did that too. To get the full picture of this, we need to remember what God has had to deal with from us. Starting with Adam and Eve's disobedience in the garden to the disobedience we see in our world today. Mankind's history is mainly the story of greed, hatred, lust, pride, and downright violence. It is the evidence of our rebellion against God, the God of love and of peace. Even our good deeds, when they're done with the right motivation to bring God honor, then those good deeds, Isaiah tells us, are like filthy rags. You know what those filthy rags are? It's what the midwives would clean up after a used to clean up after a woman gave birth, including the placenta. 
our good deeds, apart from God's motivation to bring him in honor and glory, are like filthy rags. We deserve God's wrath because of our sins. He is the Almighty God, the judge of the universe. He is holy and perfect. 1 John 1, 5 says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. God cannot overlook sin, nor can he compromise by accepting sinful behavior. Even though God is just, but he is also loving. John 3.16 God allowed his perfect son to be sacrificed, to turn away, to propitiate his wrath. God demonstrates his own love toward us, that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because of this, we don't have to fear the effects of punishment, and therefore, we don't have to blame others. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because of Christ and his redemption, I am completely forgiven and fully pleasing to God. I am totally accepted by God. Let me read that one more time. Get it. All right. Because of Christ and his redemption, I am completely forgiven and fully pleasing to God. I am totally accepted by God. Now here's some homework. Romans 5.1. You need to write that down on an index card. And also Colossians 1.1. 21 through 22. Write those verses down. When you're at a stoplight, read through them. And send a check in your text messages. Memorize those verses. Because you are totally accepted by God. Look to either person on either side of the shoe and say, I'm accepted by God. I'm accepted by God. Then we have the last trap. We got the performance trap. We have the approval trap. We got the blame trap. And then the last trap is shame. When we base our self-worth on past failures to satisfaction with how we look, with how we look, oh, how I look, (laughs) no. With how our bad habits, we fall into that last trap the shame. It is the lie that says, I am what I am. I cannot change. I am hopeless. This lie traps us into hopeless pessimism that is linked to a poor self-esteem. How do we get out of this trap? Well, God has a way. It's called regeneration. Right? You hear me? Regeneration. And one of the best stories that reflects that is Zacchaeus. It's found in Luke chapter 19, 1 through 10. Now, you all know, you all know the story of Zacchaeus. You've sang those songs, the song. I'm not going to sing it to you. Some of you might not know it. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed him by, he looked up in that tree and he said, Zacchaeus, come down. Because I must, what? Go into your house today. I'll try and wrap it. No. (laughs) Zacchaeus, you all, was a tax collector. He was the most despised person ever. The Jewish people hated tax collectors because they were collecting taxes for the Roman government. And they weren't honest tax collectors. They would spit on his face and everything. They, ha- they hated tax collectors. But Jesus, he came by. And at dinner, Zacchaeus experienced the unconditional love and the acceptance of Christ. His actions demonstrated his radical change. Through Jesus, he had a new view of life. He had a new behavior. He had new goals. Regeneration is not another self-help idea. And it's not to get my life in order from my sinful nature. Regeneration is new life 
Paul stated in Ephesians 2.5, we were once dead in our sins, but have been made alive in Christ. When you truly give your life to Christ, we experience new life, forgiveness, and love. We will begin to change. We will continue to mess up. Yes! The Bible tells us to choose to act in the ways that reveal our new lives in Christ. This all started for me all the way back in 1983 on a Monday morning. That's regeneration. That's a story for another day. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust and deceit and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self which is in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Now hear me on this. When we wrap ourselves in this new life, we are unique by allowing Christ's character to shine through us. We shine the light of Christ. And we might shine it in different ways because we are unique. Regeneration alleviates the past. We have been forgiven, chosen, and loved. We can grow and change by the Spirit of God. Will we sin? Yes. And will we have to face the consequences? Yes. But what will never, ever change is your identity in God. There is nothing that you can do to make God stop loving you. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any more than what he already does. Have you all ever seen the show Chosen? Great show. Two seasons. Susan and I have been watching it. Can't wait for the third season to come out in the third quarter of this year. I highly recommend it. So you get the app, the Angel app. It will give you a different perspective about Jesus. I was watching it. In this particular episode is when Jesus goes to the paraplegic at the pool of Bethsaida. It's John chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. There's a whole bunch of people there. Now, if you don't know about what the pool of Bethsaida is, it's a pool that were people who were ill and sick would go to. And all of a sudden, the pool would begin to bubble. And when that bubbled, they believed that they, if they got into the pool, they would be healed of whatever it was. Jesus goes there. He finds this man who's been a paraplegic for 38 years. They didn't have wheelchairs. They didn't have crutches. So all he did was lay on the mat. That was it. That was his life. Jesus comes up to him. He kneels down. And he looks the man right in the eye. And he asks them this question. Do you want to be healed? And then these traps begin to come out. The man began this, you, the shame. Well, in the blame game. Well, there's nobody here to get me into the pool. And when I try to get to the pool, people crack, kick me in the face. They spit on me. They do. I, I can't get into the pool. Jesus looks at him again. He says, that's not what I asked you. That pool can't do anything for you. What I asked you is, do you want to be healed? And the man says, yes. And Jesus stood up and told the man, take your mat and go home. When I saw that, I was thinking about this message. And I'm thinking, this is what Jesus wants to say to you today. Do you want to get out of the traps, the performance trap, the approval trap, the blame trap, 
the shame trap. Do you want to get out of the trap? Don't give them any excuses. Don't try to blame it on somebody else. Just say yes. And Jesus, because of what he did on that cross, he died for you, he died for me to keep us from those traps. Do you want to get out of the trap? Let's pray.